Good morning. I'm George Baggett with the Forum Committee at the All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church. Uh, the forum has been in operating for more than 40 years to uh, address a number of topics uh, that are uh, poignant to everybody in the Kansas City area and, and around the United States. Um, anyway, uh, we're really pleased to have Jean Baker, Peters Baker come see us, our favorite Jackson County prosecutor of all time. Is that, uh, and I, I'm going to be brief because I'm going to let her talk. So there you go. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jean, and we've known each other for a while now, probably. Um, but I have, um, I'll give you just a brief background. I was an intern in the Office of Prosecutor in um, the late 90s, and then hired by Claire McCaskill in 1997 or 8 to, um, to work there full time, and I pretty much have since then. So um, I announced earlier this year that I would not be seeking re-election. So I have, uh, my term takes me all through next year. So there's, that's plenty of time to cause a lot more trouble. That's the good news. All right. Um, we went ahead and put our mission statement up here. You know, um, you will have, you will probably be entertained to know how long it took a group of lawyers uh, to sit in a room and come up with a mission statement. It was an unpleasant experience, uh, but this is what we came up with a few years ago, and, and we've kept it. The piece of it about uh, this mission statement at the time we created it to now that has become more important is that we are looking much more at data-driven practices. Um, so one of the things I've done in the Office of Prosecutor is hire data analysts, uh, crime analysts that help us understand what it is you know, we're doing and how, we, how we're faring. So that's been a critical piece um, for policymaking. And it's shamefully uh, wasn't done for a lot of years. You know, prosecutor's offices were really just a black box. Uh, you couldn't get information out unless it was, we put out a little press release, you know, about a sentence we maybe received, um, maybe charges filed. But that was generally it, not our overall data. And today, um, you can go to my website right now, and you can pull up our dashboard, and it tells you in real time um, how we're doing. We, we have a second dashboard uh, that is regarding violence, um, so that you can kind of see as well, you know, how we're doing uh, regarding issues of violence, where those acts occur, and, um, you know, more details about that. All right, I want to go through uh, this. So we're going to have a race for prosecutor in it, and it will be a race. There's at least four people now um, that have said they want to run for that that office. And so, um, you know, I I wish them the best, and I will make sure that we turn over as steady and stable of an office as is possible, um, and that we'll be there to to help guide if if they are interested in that. But um, here's some things that I think really matter. And whoever the next DA is, um, you have to keep these things in mind. There are lots of prosecuting attorneys' offices around the country. I am one of um, 114 just in the state of Missouri. So, um, but we're all pretty different. So um, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned over time is that you got to be willing to file or actually not file sometimes the big cases um, without regard to public um, public input because a prosecutor cannot take a poll <laughs> to determine what is the right thing to do about a particular case. Uh, it is rules of evidence, facts, rules of evidence that guide whether or not a case can go forward or not. Um, and I do know that you know, we're all awaiting a decision on a big case that um, I filed, well, a grand jury filed in the year 2020. We received a conviction in the year 2022 um, on an individual police uh, detective who uh, was shot, who shot and killed a man in his garage. And that was one of those big cases that I filed, but I made nobody happy. Nobody. Uh, because most people wanted a murder charge, and I filed an involuntary manslaughter. Um, the police are still 
um, angry is not really even couldn't quite describe what they are um, about that charge, and they feel um, wronged, um, you know, in many ways because of that. So um, I think your prosecutor, your next prosecutor, has got to be someone that can withstand criticism um, and be able to to flow with it. You know, like uh, you know, don't bend too much because of a little criticism. So they got to be willing to take it a little bit. You got to be willing to take it. Um, a couple of units that we formed in the prosecutor's office is a crime strategies unit that um, involves me and Mike here. <laughs> We're in the unit. Um, Tony in the back has joined us in the crime strategies unit. Thank you for joining us, Tony. That makes us a mighty unit of at least three. But I'm lying. We have um, we have a couple of others um, in that unit as well that are crime analysts. So we really do um, look at crime holistically. Uh, we study crime so that we can better understand at a, you know, at a macro level, how can we impact crime and what are going to be some of the um, consequences for policies that we roll out. Uh, we want to think about that. We don't want to just bend crime. We want to bend it responsibly. Um, I have a conviction integrity unit. I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, showing you why. Um, there's an individual by the name of Kevin Strickland that my office had to fight uh, really damn hard <laughs> to, uh, on a really, uh, I'll just you know tell you all the way I see it, ridiculous uh, set of facts that um, shouldn't have been, we should not have had to fight that. Um, but we did, and he's been freed, but that is through this conviction integrity unit. That is a unit that looks at past convictions and you know, to determine whether or not we made a mistake and then correct that mistake. Um, I, regarding homicides, because I've been a prosecutor for a long time, there's some things that I've learned. Like, you want to have um, some, some kind of strong uh, rudders in place when it comes to whether or not to charge or not charge a homicide. Everybody wants all homicides to be charged, but nobody wants the wrong person charged. So that means, um, you know, we're going to be stuck in a, in a, some conflict uh, with some, some members of the public, victims, families sometimes, um, when we think the proof is just not adequate to get there. But it's important um, although uh, I've been a prosecutor for a very, very long time, it's important sometimes that the guilty go free, that we don't wrongfully convict the innocent. We're so, um, and I know that now so much more intimately than I did a few years ago. I understand it at a level, um, when you sit in the living rooms of individuals, uh, victims, families who believed that your office had done the right thing, they believed your office had convicted the right person, and 44 years later, you have to tell them that we didn't. Uh, it's uh, Those are hard conversations to have. And with 44 years of time, you would expect um, that a lot of healing could happen and that it wouldn't be so raw. But on each one of those families that I met with, it was raw. And I hurt them all over again. The system hurt them all over again by uh, explaining how we got that wrong. So uh, to ward against that, um, I have assistant prosecutors that go to the scene of every homicide um, in the city, in the county, by the way, um, because we spend so much time on Kansas City, we forget, we actually go all the way to Oak Grove. So, you know, um, we have to be ready wherever crime happens. And so I think it's important that you're at the scene, it's at that yellow tape, sometimes that you will see things differently than a police officer will see them. Um, because we view rules of evidence, you know, in our mind as we as we look at cases, police officers look at all possible evidence, while prosecutors look at only admissible evidence. What's only going to be admissible in a courtroom? So there's immediate conflict uh, regarding that, um, and so it's important for prosecutors to help guide through those very early moments. And at the yellow tape, you will often meet victims' families. So it's your first moment, your first moment. Uh, to start building that really difficult relationship that's ahead. Um, so beside going to the scene of homicides, um, because I have been put in the position of, uh, as a younger assistant prosecutor, and having three detectives uh, show up at my door unannounced, 
um, at my office door and say, yeah, we want you to file this homicide. Um, it's hard sometimes when, you know, I'm, I'm going five other places. Um, I'm spinning a lot of other plates and these guys, um, need my time and it's urgent. Um, and they believe, uh, they have a adequate case. And so the pressure is on. You can make bad filing decisions that way. I know that from experience. So um, in order to ward against that, the way um, I don't allow that anymore to happen, we have a homicide committee, and that is a group of senior uh, lawyers sit around a table and we really kick the tires of the evidence. We look under the hood, we kind of poke holes in it. We bring jury instructions. Because we do that, the cases are a lot stronger than they used to be. Um, and it, it also shows up in our outcomes. Our outcomes are a lot stronger uh, than they once were. So I feel more confident in the cases that we are bringing. Not that before I felt like we were bringing a bunch of innocent people to trial. I didn't. But I feel more confident that our convictions can withstand the test of time, as even as some evidence might fall off over time, uh, that there'll be other evidence that supports that. Um, but we do really unsexy stuff like Giglio and Brady flags. Um, this is important. Uh, these are cases. Giglio and Brady are cases. And those cases say that the prosecutor is responsible for notifying the defense lawyer of credibility issues um, regarding police officers. And, um, you know, I mean, you have to have a system for such a thing. I read in the, in the news recently about a, a former VA of an office that said she didn't keep, she didn't keep flags in any kind of systematic way. They just had a mental list, just mentally they knew. Like, you know, I mean, that's not possible. That's not possible. You have to find a systematic way to handle this. Now, this is not to also defame prosecutor or uh, police officers because sometimes, you know, um, Police officers may have an issue, and it doesn't mean that they are forever injured as officers, that their credibility is so poor that we'll never use them again. It just simply means that that information, we seek it, we provide it to a judge, and then we just, you know, the judge decides whether or not that information should come into evidence um, against a police officer at trial. Um, and so sometimes um, we've had cases where um, I still have used a police officer that has credibility issues um, on cases of a, a child molestation, um, but the police officer's issues um, really had nothing to do with that particular case. And so we just vetted out in front of a jury and a jury gets to decide whether or not the officer should be believed or not. So it's, it's more complicated than um, a bad police officer list. It's a lot more complicated than that. But hopefully we have a system in place for that. Um, I'm going to just touch on one more here, and that is disciplines prosecutors, because I have some battle wounds from doing that. So this is important, though. It's important. There are uh, offices that that protect, just like police sometimes protect themselves. Uh, you know, I mean, prosecutors will protect themselves, too, sometimes. And um, when I first came into office as um, appointed as the prosecutor, I had to fire three um prosecutors for all different reasons. But um, two of them had serious ethical issues, so much so I had to also report them to Missouri Bar. Um, but that that really, you know, it, um, it immediately changed the culture of the office. It changed the culture because uh, all of a sudden, you know, the word was around the water cooler, oh, damn. She will fire you. Yes. And, I, you know, I'm not trying to celebrate that. I'm just simply saying it's a re it's a requirement. It's a requirement. Um, so, and, you know, discipline doesn't have to be termination, but it can be, you just have to hold a line um, on what's required and what you're going to tolerate. Um, so disciplining those prosecutors, I want to tell you, like, how deep those wounds go. It was... 12 lawsuits were filed against me. I had two jury trials where, um, you know, there was that point where the judge said, will the defendant please rise for your verdict? And I realized that was me. <laughs> um, took six years. 
to litigate those 12 cases. Um, it cost money to do that. We were successful on all 12, um, but I also had to take on a very, very powerful labor union. Um, they have lost power since then, but at that time they were quite, quite powerful. And um, when you take on, learn this as well, when you take on um, a powerful entity, like perhaps a Catholic church or, you know, um, local 42 or firefighter union, they will fight back. They will fight back hard and maybe in what, you know, the ways they shouldn't outside of a courtroom. Um, okay. So we had this, this little case, um, you know, <laughs> I bring this up because, um, this was very early, um, in my career. In fact, I was, um, I was at a podium being sworn in uh, to the job when a prosecutor in the office came up to me and he said, hey, um, we are asking for a search warrant right now uh, to go to a law firm to receive some documents that we believe are being held on behalf of the Catholic Church. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> that's, that's not something generally do. You pick up the phone, you call, you know, you call the uh, entity and say, we'd like you to hand this over. Um, but that's, so that's how this fight began. And then I just started kind of peeling back a little layer and another layer and another layer. And we found ourselves, um, I made the decision to put this before a grand jury um, because I needed to have it investigated. Um, so that grand jury process allowed me, you know, to uh, really kind of steer my own case, steer my own investigation. And we ended up with a misdemeanor charge uh, that the bishop did, uh, was found guilty of later for failing to report suspected child abuse. I think this case, now that we're so far um, past the outcome of that case, I do think it mattered. I do think that it started to change the trajectory, um, probably not just of the Catholic Church, but of the Catholic Church. Um, they had many, many lawsuits, but the problem was that they could afford to pay those. And so they just kept paying them. Sometimes civil lawsuits can really bend an organization yeah, to change. Uh, but this one seemed to need a little more. I didn't do it for that purpose. I did it because I believed what he did was wrong and he should be punished for it. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll take other outcomes uh, that are good. Um, all right, so I think I've, I'm going to flip through some of this. We have um, many things that we wanted to talk about today, but we don't have much time. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this case and how cultural competency, in my estimation, really matters and why I think uh, your next DA should demonstrate that they have that skill out of the gate rather than learning it on the job. Um, this is Kevin Strickland. Uh, this was, you know, poor guy. He was so broke down. This was when he was still incarcerated. He was in year 44 of a hard 50 sentence for a triple homicide that had occurred where a fourth person had been shot as well. And I think some of the things that really got Kevin um, in, you know, charged is that at the time he's 18 years old. He didn't look like this. He was 18. And he made some real inflammatory statements. There's some dispute about what he actually said. Um, but even Kevin would agree, yeah, I said some stuff, you know, that I probably shouldn't have said. Like, um, he doesn't, you know, that one of the statements was, uh, I didn't do this, so, you know, uh, you, you, you can't do this to me. And he was very angry because the detectives were, you know, also showing their prowess. And he says something to the effect of, when I'm back out there on the streets, you better get, you better get the draw on me first. <laughs> something an 18 year old would say, but probably not something you want to say to homicide detectives. Probably not. Um, another thing that got him is that he had a familiarity with the actual killers in the case. Um, he did know them. They were part of his neighborhood though. Uh, he went to school with some of them. And um, so that statement, he had to be good for something is a statement I've heard many times before. What a dangerous thing to say. Reckless and dangerous, um, but I've heard that before. The hair, the hair, the hair was pretty critical here. Um, so I want to kind of flip through this case real quick and tell you about the hair. But this was a triple homicide that occurred in 1978. Um, this is what Kevin looked like. 
This is what Kevin looked like. This is the house uh, on Benton where those murders occurred. Uh, they were really, really awful. People were tied up and shot execution style. And in fact, the fourth surviving witness was tied to her best friend um, while they were both shot. Cynthia, my surviving witness, um, pretended that she was dead so she wouldn't get shot again. When the killers leave, um, she unties herself from her best friend, knowing her best friend is most clearly dead. Um, and she crawls out um, of the home to a neighbor house, and then police come. I didn't want to, you know, name the actual, who we think is the actual suspect here, but you can see Mr. Strickland um, at his booking photo, um, and you can see who we think is the likely um, third suspect in that case. And it's not a doppelganger, um, but it is a... I can see how you could make a mistake. Um, they're both, you can't tell from these photos uh, terribly well, but they're both about the same skin tone. Um, they're both really close to the, si the same age and this, you know, same height, pretty close, and the same um, weight. So, you know, it, um, identification um, can be a tricky thing in our business. And luckily, we've learned a lot about that over time. Um, before I want to get to the hair, I want to talk to you about there are two separate juries for Mr. Strickland. The very first one um, was an all-white, I'm sorry, was a had a lone African-American juror on it. Everyone else was white. This was before a, a United States Supreme Court called Batson that prevents this kind of misbehavior now, but at the time it was allowed. But that first jury hung. It actually hung, meaning one holdout, just happened to be the lone African-American female, uh, said, I don't think he's guilty. I will not vote to convict. Imagine the pressure in a room when 11 other white people think he's guilty. So as the tale goes, um, I can't affirm all of these things being true, but um, the story goes that the young prosecutor leans across the counsel table and says, we won't let that happen again. And they didn't. The second jury is picked a uh, short time later, and it is an all-white jury. And of course, they do convict um, to a hard 50 at the time. And um, 44 years was actually not even quite enough time for our governor to free him. So we had to, we had to do it the hard way. Um, so my surviving witness, Cynthia Douglas, says the man wielding the shotgun had a natural in his hair. His hair was in a natural, but Mr. Strickland clearly has braids. This is important because the murders occur at 8 p.m., but it's that next morning, 6.30 a.m., that Kevin is arrested. So you have about 10 and a half hours. Um, so there were a lot of issues with the case um, that don't involve the hair. But one of the things um, that we discovered about his hair is that it's really an impossibility that he did this. If you know anything really about black hair, you're going to know that's not possible. Because if you look at Kevin's hair, you got to look close. These are old photos and they're not very clear and I can't make them much clearer um, as I couldn't to my um, retired judge who came to listen to me, white woman, talk to him, white male, about black hair. But um, there's frays. So these are not fresh braids. And um, it's just not possible that if he had a natural at 8 p.m. and he's wielding the shotgun, um, killing people with a natural, that he would then go home, have his hair braided, make it look messy, so it, cause it's just, it's not going to work out. That's not going to work out. I don't know what the lone holdout uh, really thought in his first trial, but I bet she knew this. I bet she just, she knew this. Um, even though I made these arguments to a judge, I actually put a woman on the stand that, um, you know, could talk about black hair. Um, he was unimpressed and thought it was, you know, it, kind of a foolish point. But to me, 
uh, knowing a bit about black hair. Thank you, Patty, for helping teach me about black hair. Um, it, it is an impossibility. Now, there's some other stuff, like we retested the prints on the shotgun, and they weren't Kevin's. And we tested uh, the 356 prints left in the home, and not one of them belonged to Kevin Strickland. And Cynthia Douglas uh, realizes that she made a mistake. She sits in the back of the courtroom uh, for a co-defendant, um, Vincent Bell, who is pleading guilty to the crime. When the judge asks uh, Mr. Bell, why are you pleading guilty today? He says, because you all convicted a guy who wasn't even there. So I'm trying to get the best deal I can. And Cynthia Douglas is sitting in the back of the courtroom hearing all of this. And that went on for quite a while. Uh, this was a pretty protracted um, hearing, about three hours for him to plead guilty, where he went into great detail about Kevin Strickland, otherwise known at Nardi at the time, didn't, wasn't with them and didn't commit this crime. He held firm on that for 40 years until he died, that Kevin wasn't there. A co-defendant who also pled guilty, um, who's still living, he held firm and said Kevin Strickland wasn't there. Now, they weren't going to name uh, the other fellas who were with them, but, um, but they were clear that it wasn't Kevin. So Cynthia uh, tries very hard to make that make the world know that she made a mistake. So we believe, uh, she told that same young prosecutor um, in the courtroom that day, in the back of Vincent Bell's uh, hearing where he's pleading guilty. And I don't know what was said after that, because Cynthia Douglas died, um, but I do know nothing happened. I do know that Kevin continued to serve. So, um, That's kind of a close-up of hair. It's best we could best we could do. Um, Cynthia Douglas, I'd like to just say about her for a moment. Um, how could she get it so wrong? How could she be so very wrong? I know how. I believe I know how. As she climbs out of this um, home, where three people inside are dead, including her best friend. I don't mean to be overly graphic with you, but she has her best friend's brain matter on her because they were so close to each other when her friend was shot. She's also shot. So she has fresh bleeding wounds. And because uh, you saw the picture with all the people that surrounded that house that night, uh, this was a big deal. Many people showed up to the crime scene that night, but so did, um, I'll call him her brother-in-law. It was a, a fellow her sister were seriously dating. He comes flying to the scene. She describes to him who um, who the who the people were that she believed were there. She was able to name Vincent Bell and another fellow she was able to name, Adkins. And then um, he says, that sounds like Nardi. So he kind of fed her the name. He too, you know, uh, was just trying to help because he said, I saw them together earlier that day. So she becomes somewhat convinced. Um, she gives that name to the responding police officer, Nardi. I believe Nardi was with them as well. And he's the one wielding the shotgun. And then she goes on to the hospital. She gets her wounds sewed up. And then she immediately goes to the police department after that. Now, she still hasn't showered. So she still has her friend's brain matter on her. While well, she gives a statement to police. That's traumatic. She's had a she's had a very traumatic evening. Now, because the world only you know um, in Missouri says you must file within 24 hours or you release people, this can be a problem. Uh, to release a, someone you believe is a killer is, is hard. Um, I've had to do it, and you, know, you want to make sure you you get it right, but you also don't want to put the you know public at more risk. Um, maybe the FOP, that's the Fraternal Order of Police, maybe they have something right here when they require two sleep cycles by a police officer who did a shooting before they speak, before they give a statement, because of that trauma that they're in. We just don't allow the same for victims. 
So we, um, as prosecutors, have to be much more mindful about that. Okay, I'm going to flip. This is Kevin today. I thought you might want to see Kevin. He's um, he's been out for a couple of years. Um, he's gotten a lot of health care out of prison. He stands on his own two feet now. He is no longer in a wheelchair. Um, and actually, he he left me a message just probably about two weeks ago. He was on a run. He was jogging for the first time. So he's he's really doing well. Um, all right. Um, oh, this is just you know maybe me being a little petty because I'm still a little mad about this, Kevin Strickland, because I had to go up against other state prosecutors, the attorney general's office who fought to keep him in. But they have the same ethic I do. They take the same oath I do. So I don't know how you can intellectually get to a position where you're fighting to keep somebody in prison when all the evidence, all the evidence says we got it wrong. Um, sometimes issues are they're more gray and muddled than this. Kevin Strickland's case was not gray. It was very clear. So um, I'm going to be mad about that for a while. Um, so quickly, we, we, you know, we do some other things. We take um, now we, we take trips to Montgomery, Alabama, um, where we uh, send a group of people from law enforcement, courts, uh, prosecutor's office, so that we can learn more about um, America's very complicated and still very secret racial history and how it intersects in the criminal justice system. And um, this is this is hard, but these trips are important. And then you come home and you re you see, oh, that's right, Jackson. There's Jackson on a horse in front of our courthouse. Um, what message are we sending? That this is open to all, that this is going to be, this is a, this, this building is where everybody can get justice? Maybe not. So um, the statue voters in, in Jackson County decided to keep Jackson where he is um, in the year 2020 on the ballot. But um, we did what we put a plaque at least on Jackson to at least acknowledge, you know, his a, a, a better context of his history. I'm not trying to defame Andrew Jackson. It's just history. They're just facts. Uh, the Trail of Tears was a, was a real thing. And what I can appreciate, at least during Jackson's time, is that um, the Trail of Tears um, was actually called the Indian Removal Act. And don't you just appreciate when legislation is just says exactly what it is? Today, that would be called something quite different, you know, and we'd all wonder if there's some good news behind it. Um, drugs, I've talked to you all about drugs before, but um, data analysts have taught me in my own office, doing a deep dive on our own data, um, that we had a grotesque problem in the office. I was unwittingly taking any cases that were brought to me, and if the evidence was there, we filed them. Um, that would presume that all parts of the city were being policed in the same way. When we looked at our, yeah, someone laughed in the back. <laughs> um, what we learned here is that um, our drug cases, I knew would be racially uh, disparate. We knew there would be a great imbalance, but this was far beyond what I ever imagined it would be. Our by bus cases, um, were 81 to 84 percent of those cases in my office were people of color. Let me be let me be specific, more specific, um, black people. And what is a by bust? That is a that's where police to you know are going to um, they want they suspect somebody is a drug dealer. They start buying drugs from them, and boom, now we have a felony. Um, all drug cases, however, in the office had a really lopsided, um, in no way that no one that could be explained, um, racial imbalance. All of them. It was it they, it was really shocking um, how bad the numbers were. What we also learned is that those drug cases were not tied to violence in any particular way. Only about twenty five percent of our drug cases had any connection to violence, not just in that case itself, but in the person's whole jacket. So what I had been taught as an assistant prosecutor is that drugs will equal violence. You just wait for it. It's a straight line. It will happen. But that's actually not true. Well, our data says it's not true. 
five years of our data, and I used a very wide definition of violence. Very, very wide. I included um, child endangerment charges in there. And that could be your kid was in the car um, when drugs were discovered. That's really probably not there, but I was trying to make it as broad as I could. Um, and shockingly, um, guns were not as nearly as prevalent uh, in a, as a connection to these drug cases that, as I anticipated they would be. Um, I don't remember that stat. Do you, Mike, on how many people were connected with guns? Yeah, maybe it's 33% of our cases of, of all drugs um, had connections to guns or a gun present in the case. It was surprising, surprising. So um, the other not surprising piece is where those cases came from. Proust is really the line of where the cases came from. Not on this side of Troost, on the west side. It was on the east of Troost and around um, just south of Independence Avenue. So um, this just shows you a little bit of how uh, deep we went into uh, the identification of drugs. We wanted to see everything we could figure out about drugs. And we, we went back five years with our own data. We tried to get other people's data. We, I tried to get the federal government's data as well. Since I had um, data analysts that were able to do this kind of work, but I couldn't get that. So um, we went with the data that we had, and it was it was a lot. Uh, because by the way, this amounted to about 1,400 felons coming out of the Kansas City, Missouri uh, Police Department to my office annually. Think about that, 1,400. And what were we achieving? So we changed the policy. Um, we changed the policy that um, now, if you want to bring me a drug case, you feel free to do that, police officer. But you have to show me that this person has a nexus to violence in some way, or that they're a neighborhood nuisance. That means, you know, the neighborhood said, hey, we want you to do something about this person, um, because nobody wants a drug dealer on their block. Um, a active drug house. So, um, so we still carry them, but those are far, far, far fewer in number. Now, I did this because it, the year was 2020, and we, I thought, huh, how are we going to survive here with COVID and keep this system moving? I was trying to figure out what, you know, how can I just pare it down and go to cases of violence? Um, what else could I do with, you know, any other section of cases? I never expected to find quite uh, what I discovered with KCPD. The good news is my other police departments in Jackson County, they don't have these, they didn't have these kinds of policies where they really uh, worked hard to find drug cases, build drug cases, um, and bring them uh, to the office. It was really uh, just that one department, um, but they're well-resourced department um, in that particular unit, and uh, so we changed it. And so now, um, like I said, the we have a new policy on drugs, and it really dropped the filings from about 1,400 annually to about 300. So, okay, so questions, anybody? Hang on a minute here. Um, we'll say we're going to take up a collection. I have a new drafty uh, uh, collector today, Ken Smith. He'll be collecting the, uh, the, the uh, offering. And then um, please uh, make your questions in the in the form of questions rather than statements. You are. You are. Come ahead if you line up here or if you'd like to give it. There are an, a number of new citizen led groups around town that either have been functioning a while or just started functioning. Are there any of those that you are particularly encouraged by? Yeah. Or not necessarily an official endorsement, but you like what they're doing and you're hopeful that they will succeed. Could you talk Absolutely. about any of those? I'm really excited about um, some of what's happening in Kansas City from a social services perspective. So combat, since I oversee this tax, I should make this plug. Uh, combat is a very important tax. It allows uh, funding of prosecutors offices and you know in our Jackson County jail and police but it also gives money a lot of money to treatment and prevention of crime um, 
drug treatment, whole variety of issues. So we have started using combat um, resources more efficiently to make sure all those people, all those agencies that we're funding, you know, can come together and share information that we're getting uh, services to the right people, or at least key people that could help us um, in the future regarding crime reduction. They are working with a variety of organizations like um, KC Common Good as well. Um, there's organizations that uh, we are not funding, but called Uncornered, uh, that are making, I think, a strong impact in Kansas City. And back when uh, Daryl Forte and Mayor James and I launched this focused deterrence effort, and we, we dropped the homicide rate uh, to a 50-year low, we didn't have any of this. We didn't have this kind of social service support. So now it exists. Uh, so we just got to get law enforcement and prosecutors you know, back to the table and we're working, we're working really hard on that so that we can, you know, kind of carry the law enforcement piece of that responsibly with the social services piece. So I'm very hopeful that once we do that, once we kind of get our gears rolling, um, that we can make a real safe city again. I, first, a, a brief comment, my apologies. Um, because it's so well publicized, uh, I had no idea it took so long to prepare a case. I've been watching the Trump cases as they evolve. And the, in spite of overwhelming evidence, et cetera, et cetera, it just takes a really long time. So I'm amazed at what prosecutors have to do before they actually file a case or bring it to a grand jury. Anyway, having said that, uh, based on what uh, Jeff was saying, there, there are interventions that I've heard of, like um, working with people who are shot but not killed, you mm -hmm. know, so that they don't, you know, go back to the streets and try to get vengeance. But also really, really focused policing on uh, troubled areas, which, you know, seek to find out who the folks are that are causing the problems and so on. Which strategy do you think has the best chance of? lowering our crime rate, which is just like crazy. I, I think if we went back to a focused deterrence effort, you have to, it's how it's deployed, it's how it's implemented, I guess, is is going to be its level of success or not. And then um, there's a pretty frayed trust, you know, with community um, and law enforcement. So that that must improve. But one thing, one way that could improve is if law enforcement is able to show that they're a credible partner, meaning an act of violence occurs in that community and it's solved. The case is solved and it's, it's brought to the prosecutor for prosecution. And now it's about one in two uh, homicides get brought uh, to me from Kansas City. That's not true in eastern Jackson County. Their numbers are a lot higher. Their, their numbers are actually a lot lower. So they have, you know, but th their solve rate is much, much higher. It's, you know, that's um, explainable in that way. But non-fatal shootings must be handled as if it's a homicide that just didn't quite occur. So we have to put that kind of a time and attention on that case and give it the import that it deserves um, because it, it, it stirs up a whole uh, mess, you know, for a family and a community. Um, and when we just allow uh, a non-fatal shooting victim to suffer on their own without service or regard, you know, our law enforcement system that's able to to address the harm that's happened, um, I I think we kind of deserve what we get and we return. Then we have to lead what a healthy community would look like, and a healthy community does not allow a person who's been shot and injured to suffer on their own and to figure out you know, um, how to put one foot in front of the other, how to support their family uh, from lost income, and all the things that can happen. So um, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, um, except I do know that non-fatal shootings need to have a particularized focus. We've done a lot of work um, giving them focus and help when they go to the hospital to get sewn up. You know, combat funds a program um, that gives them trauma treatment at their bedside. I didn't think, bluntly, I didn't think this program was going to work. Um, although I trusted the people that were, that were doing it. Um, but please tell me, um, so rarely, uh, will people cooperate with them? And then I thought, well, the, the same people 
are going to trust a mental health provider that they don't know. I figure this is not going to work, but it does. About 75% of those uh, individuals who are shot take the trauma treatment services that are offered to them. So, um, so we're doing some things, but that's at one hospital, and it needs to be at all, all hospitals. Cyrus. Well, with Ka when Casey Nova was was in place, um, what what type of successes did did these did these clients have? We had, I think, back to the year twenty fourteen because it was such a great year uh, for Casey Nova. The homicide rate was dropped to its fifty year low. Imagine if we could say something like that today, um, but that was because of a high level of co of collaboration. Um, no secret, we had a police chief in after that guy, after that's, that said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to work with that prosecutor. So, um, I don't blame him for, you know, the numbers, you know, going now to the highest that we've had, but it's a factor. You must collaborate. And it's not just a police officer and a prosecutor have to collaborate. It's got to be much greater than that. Um, you know, to, to include community as a whole. So, while the homicide rate was dropped um, and our non-fatal shooting rate dropped greatly that year as well. Another great thing that happened was that our solve rate went up. Police were able to solve the homicides that did occur at a much higher rate. I think it was um, over 70% that year. So um, it, when it works, it really works. It really works. But your intelligence has to be good. Um, we all have to be um, making sure that we have very good intelligence. Otherwise, a program like that will not work. First of all, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Um, and talking to us. I want to ask, well, I want to say, first of all, the I think the main difference is the lens that you look through. And so I want to thank you for looking through a different lens that has been looked at in the past through mm -hmm. you like you taking a trip to whatever or creating different things so thank you for that and then in the community where I am we have crisis intervention teams and I was wondering if if that was active here and is there any way that that can be like a requirement that's one and then two when I sat on the committee they were talking about it, and it kind of went fast by over my head and it sounded like they said the crisis intervention teams are for the police officers. I thought it was for the community. Can you clarify that? Or the well, I think it's twofold. Um, I do think um, that the KCPD has done a good job putting together crisis intervention teams and really uh, trying new tactics um, on how they respond in cases. I think I've seen that, you know, also in the the deployment of their resources. So I want to give them credit for that because they have um, they have changed through through that you know looking at mental health and how mental health uh, may cause an incident and how maybe they can respond and maybe it might be best in moments to retreat or do a safe retreat. So um, so they've really gone a long distance in the last few years regarding uh, crisis intervention. But they also do it for themselves as well, which is important because police see a lot of horrible things. Um, you know, they see they see death through car wrecks, so um, they're often that very first responder. Um, you know, they need to be taken care of as well, so that they can go back on the job and and do their job uh, for us the way we want them to. So, um, you know, I hope you don't hear that I'm I'm negative about them. I do think that. All of us, my office, uh, the KCPD, should improve its practices and that we should continue to adapt to new ways of, of doing our business um, rather than being resistant to that or reflexive against, against change. Um, but that's one area where they really have done it. With the data collection that you're doing or have been doing, um, are they you- They want you to step a little closer to the mic. <laughs> with the with the data collection that your office is doing now, are you able to tease out or see um, what the groups like Aim for Peace or 
other peer type of groups like that, what kind of impact they're having, if any? It is difficult um, for us to to ascribe a, um, you know, where the change is actually happening, unless it's it's something pretty large. Like in the year 2020, homicides dropped so low, we actually take credit for that. <laughs> Although I'm sure, you know, there are organizations like Aim for Peace that would say we had a lot to do with that too. And they, you know, and they probably did. But um, it's difficult from a data collection standpoint to understand necessarily um, you know, what was really bending the change without time. And in law enforcement, we tend not to be given time. <laughs> right. People want the answer right away. And, but, but to get a complete answer, you know, it does take um, time away from the problem to kind of see what happened. That's why I feel like I can, I can look at my early years in office much more effectively than maybe the, the ones that are, um, you know, I'm living through right now. Good morning. Good morning. Um, when you were here several months ago, you shared with us like rates of different types of crimes that were solved. Yeah. And um, I think you said nationally about that in terms of fraud, financial crimes, like nationally, it was about 3%. In the Kansas City area, it's about 2%. So in my family, my father was financially exploited the last nine months of his life. And probably about $2 million was stolen. And we have um, financial records detailing about 1.2 million. Um, and I had to interact with the Kansas City Police Department several times, um, and they were so rude and dismissive. Um, so I tried to find other phone numbers, other people to talk to, and they, nobody would answer the phone. Like it was just a complete dead end. So. I understand today you're talking about homicides, right, and shootings, and that's more important. But like, where where do family members go when they discover this kind of loss and exploitation? It, even less than that, you know. Well, um, you do go through a police entity. Yeah. But if you stay after you give me your name, we'll check. I'll see if if we can get something rolling um, regarding your own case whether, you know, I, there's some issues maybe surrounding that. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it helps when I call the police. I mean, like we, we would call the elder abuse number and nobody, I mean, I would, nobody would answer. I mean, yeah. it's just like, maybe there are no resources for this. Right. Um, let's stick, stick around and I'll, I'll get your information and we'll see what we can do. Thank you for your work. You're welcome. Um, we at All Souls are trying to form a team to do something about gun violence. Yeah. And we would just appreciate your thoughts on what could a, a congregation do? Um, what orga outside organizations should we support? What can we do within our community? Yeah, okay, this is, this is tough um, because the... Um, I'm close enough to the end of my term, I think I can say out loud, I think we have an absurd reading of the Second Amendment. It's absurd. And it's hurting us. But um, that's the prevailing view. Um, and what I view as absurd, that's the prevailing view. <clears throat> we need some gun regulation. And you can get it maybe in smaller ways. And, you know, I think um, not just a group like this, but the majority of Americans believe in gun regulation, if you break it down in certain ways, full background checks rather than the loopholes. Um, Americans support that, and we should have it. Um, red flag laws, they don't solve all problems, but they might solve one or two, or they might solve a something. Um, that we, So we want those. Why wouldn't we uh, give ourselves a head start? And then uh, safe storage. Um, that is simply, you know, if you have a gun and you need to keep it locked up or don't leave it on the coffee table uh, where a two-year-old can pick it up. Um, states that have state safe storage laws have lower accidental discharge by kids. Um, our suicide rate is high uh, by teens with guns because uh, guns are, are so easy to get. So... Um, 
this doesn't solve all problems, um, but it sure would give us a respite. It would give us some help. And for those who may argue the slippery slope argument, what's next? We can't even see the slope. It's so far away. You know, so, I, so we don't have to worry about the slope. But, you know, I mean, other countries are able to do this, and we're just not. Um, and we're paying a hell of a price for it. Not so much us in this room, I think, but the people that pay the price for this really um, are in marginalized communities. So we hear a lot about mass shootings. Uh, mass shootings are awful, terrible, especially when they occur at a school. No one's going to argue that, you know, that there are four mass shootings or it wasn't that bad of a mass shooting. Um, they're terrible. But what is also terrible is the, the slow homicide that occurs um, every few days in Kansas City. Someone loses their life. It's often a person of color. It's often a male. And he's often youngish, under 34. And it's hard for um, all of America to care about that. And that says something about us as well. Um, <laughs> okay. I'll take claps. I, yeah. I, I'm more than willing to accept that. The, um, one of the questions, I got a combination of questions from the YouTube, uh, but I'll, I'll make it uh, a little different because I'm I had the same question. The you shared some thoughts about the anti-trans laws that are in effect. Would you give your thoughts on the state legislature's laws regarding trans and uh, drag queen and those kinds of situations? Thank you. Well, drag queens, we spent a whole legislative session really worrying about drag queens. And um, I'm not really, you know, I'm not really sure what to say about that. It was bizarre and I still find it bizarre. And maybe I'm grateful. Uh, that I think it was Columbia, Missouri sponsored, had some um, school event where a drag queen was present and maybe even had the mic for a moment or two. Um, and that that kicked off a whole legislative session regarding uh, drag queens. And I maybe, you know, like more bad stuff would have gotten passed if it weren't for that drag queen. So... <laughs> So it's all in how you look at it, I guess. But trans, um, you know, trans people are uh, individuals that are marginalized. Yeah. And um, any any group that's marginalized is going to be uh, more prone to crime and violence. And so I, I think the we should have done the reverse. We should have done more things to protect them uh, than malign them. Uh, what would be the impact on crime if we could manage to get all kids through high school without negative encounters with law enforcement? Yeah, that's that would be huge. Um, we know that um, getting people through high school, if you have a high school diploma, uh, your chances at a more stable life is just period across the board. Um, so... While it's not 100% the answer, it is like we said, one of those answers that you put in the bucket. Some gun regulation would be an answer. Um, an education system that got people all the way through uh, a high school diploma is, is another answer. We should have all, all of those tools in our toolbox. Real quick. Okay. I'm an immigration attorney, and the cultural competency piece I, I represent a lot of clients that are victims of gun violence here in town. Yeah. Drive-by shootings, their houses, they're having a birthday party, and there's a drive-by shooting, and they're unsolvable. But they're not unsolvable. Okay. They're unsolved, but they're not right. unsolvable. They're not. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Language is a barrier for sometimes cooperating with our police department and the prosecutor's office. You bet. What steps are you guys taking to reach people that aren't English fluent? Yeah, look, um, I'll, I'll pick on myself on this. This is an area where we have not uh, done uh, as good a job as we need to. So I do use outside organizations uh, to help me with that language barrier. Um, I've tried to pay stipends in the office, you know, for people who have a language skill uh, that we can utilize. Um, it's it is a it's it's a difficult thing to do. Um, I think language is one important issue, but if you look at the demographics of Kansas City and 
how, you know, what our demographics look like. Our main problem in my estimation is we are 39% black part of Kansas City that's in Jackson County. Um, but black people are overrepresented in our system as victims and defendants. And so we have to figure that out, not with the trope answer uh, that I think I, I brought up the last time I was here from the Ingrams magazine. Yuck. Yeah. Yuck. Uh, yuck. I just say yuck. It's terrible. Ugh. Um, there are answers to this, um, and they're answers that can have a real, um, make a real difference. So, you know, I'll just say, I know that America is terribly divided. It's an obvious statement because we've been divided uh, for quite a while now. But I would work with anybody um, on issues like this to help me solve a problem. I don't care what someone's um, religious views are or what their political views are, truly could care less. And that Places um, where it matters not at all about how divided you are, what your politics are, is when crime strikes and you end up in a courtroom. Politics do not survive in a courtroom. They just don't. Um, so it's, I will say, this is one of the best systems um, in the world, our criminal justice system. Imperfect. Imperfect. Um, but we do still have mechanisms to correct uh, mistakes um, and generally... Uh, the outcomes that can come out of our courtrooms, you know, are ones that we can be proud of. I want to thank you for speaking to us today. Um, next week, we're going to have Craig Ballin will be speaking on CAFOs and the mm -hmm. cruelty to animals and the unsafe conditions at these uh, facilities. And thank you very much for being here. You're welcome. Uh, maybe a few minutes in the library. Yeah. Um,